Hello, and welcome to the Murder House Radio Show. I'm your host, X, and on this show we will be covering serial killers, killers, mass shooters, disappearances, true crime, and the most deplorable things in people in history, and all that good dark stuff. The Murder House Radio Show will be a radio show slash podcast. I'll be uploading videos every Friday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So sit down, get comfortable, grab some coffee or whatever your preferred beverage is, turn off the lights, and enjoy the show. Today's episode will be about Jack the Ripper. Now, he has never been caught, so no one knows what he looks like. So, hence that picture. Also, he's uh, one of my, uh, well, I wouldn't say favorites, but uh, he's one of uh, the most interesting killers I find because he was never caught. Him and the Zodiac Killer. Also, the links to the sources are in the description. I'm using Wikipedia or whatever because all the information is gathered from a bunch of sources and culminated on this page. But I'm not going to be reading everything, so go check out the link. And I'm not going to read everything so I don't get pinned for plagiarism or whatever, you know. So for those of you who don't know, Jack the Ripper was a notorious serial killer who did his killings in the 1800s, around 1888. So, uh, yeah, he killed around South London, I'm pretty sure. And this was a largely impoverished area and around the Whitechapel district of London. So back then, all that poor stuff, and it would go under the radar. So in both crime case files and contemporary journalist accounts, the killer was called the Whitechapel Murderer and the Leather Apron. Oh, that's interesting. Did not know that. But um, the attacks ascribed to Jack the Ripper typically involved female prostitutes who lived and worked on the east end of London. Their throats were usually cut prior to abdominal mutilations. So uh, yeah, most of them had their throats slit ear to ear and they were disemboweled and uh, yeah. Um, the removal of internal organs from the at least three of the victims led to proposals that the killer had some sort of anatomical or surgical knowledge. So they think he was like a doctor or a butcher, but most likely a doctor. Because uh, he did all these things with uh, extreme and precise skill. It's crazy too because he did a few of these killings out in like the middle of the street. Of course it was at night, but it was in the middle of the street and there was people wandering the streets. So he like memorized like the police patterns and stuff. And uh, yeah, he was able to slip away and avoid detection. So that's pretty gnarly if you ask me. And of course this was before cameras and now we all know. England and London and all that stuff. They have like the most cameras in the world. So rumors circulated soon after that the murders were connected. And this was in September and October 1888. He also sent letters to the police like taunting them and stuff. Some of them were actually him and others were just hoaxes because, you know, people like to, uh, pull pranks on the police but who would want to uh pull a sadistic prank like that and a uh, chance getting caught for several murders it just doesn't make sense the letters however were received by the media outlets in the scotland yard from individuals prompting to be the murderer you know like i said Still doesn't make sense. The name Jack the Ripper originated in a letter, so he gave himself the name. But this was written by an individual claiming to be the murderer. And the name was uh, promptly spread throughout the media until what we have today. The letter is widely believed to have been a hoax. And many have been written by journalists in attempts to heighten interests in the story and increase their newspaper circulation. Oh, so newspapers were uh, writing false letters and possibly sending them to themselves so uh, they could boost their rates, bro. 
the From Hell letter received by George Lucas, Lukes, L-U-S-K, Lukes, of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee came with half of a preserved human kidney. So uh, I think that's a real one right there. That's a real letter. Uh, purportedly taken from one of the victims, the public came... The public came increasingly to believe in a single serial killer known as Jack the Ripper, mainly because of both the extraordinarily brutal nature of the murders and media coverage of the crimes. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, there were a total of 11 murders committed in the Whitechapel in Springfield areas between 1888 in 1891, so only a few years. Uh, this was unable to connect all the killings conclusively to the murder of 1888. Alright, so that's basically saying the first set of murders, the ones he's known for, and that were they were pretty sure were for sure him, were committed then, and then there was a further six more murders that could have been him. And then the first five victims were uh, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly are also known as the Canonical Five. So these were the first five murders that they were like, we're pretty sure this is the same person. So, um, and their murders between 30, the 31st of August and November 6th. 9th 1888 are often considered the most likely to be linked which makes sense because they're all uh, pretty similar and we'll get into that the murders were never solved obviously and the legends surrounding these crimes became a combination of historical research folklore and uh pseudo history yeah that makes sense there's a lot of films he's probably looking up from hell like I did a good job. I'm a legend, motherfucker. Alright, so here's a little uh, background before we get into the murders. In the mid-19th century, uh, Britain experienced a bunch of Irish immigrants who swelled the population of the major cities. And I'm guessing this is because of the potato famine. And this included the East End of London. So maybe they're guessing it was uh, most likely an Irish serial killer. From uh, 1882, Jewish refugees fleeing pogroms, pogroms in Tassarist, 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 Russia, and other areas of Eastern Europe immigrated into the same area. So it was a melting pot. The parish of Whitechapel in London's East End became increasingly overcrowded with the population increasing to approximately 80,000 inhabitants by 1888. That's a lot of people, especially for back then. Work and housing conditions worsened, obviously, and a significant economic underclass developed. Yeah, that makes sense. 55% of the children born in the East End died before they were five years old. That's sad. Robbery, violence, alcohol dependency were commonplace, which uh, is, hasn't really changed if you look at a lot of the poor communities today. And the epidemic po endemic poverty drove many women to prostitution to survive on a daily basis. Also, a lot of serial killers like to target uh, prostitutes because... Uh, it's a lesser chance they'll get caught. So in October 1888, London's Metropolitan Police Service estimated that there were 62 brothels and 1,200 women working as prostitutes in the Whitechapel area. With approximately 8,500 people residing in the 233 common loading houses within the white chapel every night oh. okay with the nightly price of a single bed being 4d so i'm guessing that's four shillings or 
fucking pounds. I don't know. And the cost of sleeping upon a lean-to, a hangover, rope stretched across the bedrooms of the houses being 2D. So they had to pay to live in tents, basically. For adults or children. Holy, that's sad. The economic problems in Whitechapel were comp accompanied by a steady rise in social tension between 1886 and 1889 frequent demonstrations led to the police intervention and public unrest such as the bloody sunday 1887 anti-semites crimes native nativism nativ yeah nativism racism social disturbance and severe Deprivation influenced public perception that Whitechapel was a notorious den of immorality. Oh, shite. So I think it's because it was a melting pot and all the poor and shady shit going on. The rest of uh, Britain or whatever was like, oh, don't go to Whitechapel. Stay away from the South End kind of deal. Kind of like how Chicago, Ch Chicago, Chicago in the South Side is known as Chirac. And people are like, yeah, don't go there unless you want to get shot kind of deal. Not to the same extent as this, but like, kind of, kind of. Such perceptions were strengthened in the uh, autumn of 1888 when the series of vicious and grotesque murders attributed to Jack the Ripper received unpresented coverage in the media, yeah. If there's a serial killer stalking around one side of town, you're not going to want to go there, especially if it's already a shady side of town. So there's a little backstory to all this. So let's get into the murders. So there was like a large number of attacks against women around this time on the East End. So uh, they didn't really know how many victims were attributed to Jack the Ripper. But uh, 11 separate murders stretching from April 3rd, 1888 to February 13th, 1891 were included in London's Metropolitan Police Service investigation and were known collectively in the police docket as the Whitechapel murders. So these ones stuck out the most. So opinions vary as to whether these murders should be linked to the same culprit but five of the 11 Whitechapel murders, known as the Canonical Five, are widely believed to be the work of Jack the Ripper. Yes, like I said. Most experts point to the deep slash wounds to the throat, so his signature uh, offing, followed by the extensive abdominal and uh, genital area mutilation. Yes, very uh, point two. But uh, yeah... Interesting. The first two cases in the Whitechapel murders files, those of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tambara, Tambaram, are not included in the Nautical Five. Smith was robbed and sexually assaulted in Osborne Street, Whitechapel, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on April 3rd, 1888. She had been bludgeoned about the face and received a cut to her ear a blunt object was also inserted into her vagina rupturing her peritonum peritonum no clue if i said that right uh hold on what's this peritonum is the serious membrane forming lining of the abdominal cavity and colum in the okay word she developed Peritonis and died the following day at London Hospital. Oh, she made it to the hospital, damn. But yeah, that makes sense because it doesn't really fit his MO. Smith stated that she'd been attacked by two or three men, one of whom she described, yo, she was still awake too, damn. So she described one of them as a teenager. This attack was linked to the later murder by the press, but most authorities attribute Smith's murder to general East End gang violence unrelated to the... Yeah, that makes sense. Tambaram was murdered on the staircase landing in George Yard, Whitechapel on August 7th, 1888. She had suffered 39 stab wounds to her throat, lungs, heart, liver, spleen, stomach, and abdominal 
abdomen with additional knife wounds inflicted to the breast and vagina. Damn. Someone got mommy issues right there. Yeah, that was a fucked up joke. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> All but one of the Tamaram's wounds had been inflicted with a bladed instrument, such as a pen knife, and the one possible exception. All the wounds had been inflicted by a right-handed individual, so he switched hands once, but most of them were right-handed. Tamaram had not been raped. So, uh, that kind of coincides with the Jack the Ripper, just, uh, minus the mutilations. The savagery of this murder, the lack of obvious motive, and the closeness of location and date to the later canonical Ripper murders led police to link this murder to those later committed by Jack the Ripper. Anonical, anonical, I'm sorry. I messed that up. Your boy can't read sometimes. However, this murder differs from the later anonical murders because although Tambaram had been repeatedly stabbed, she had not suffered any slash wound to her throat or abdomen. Many experts do not connect Tambaram's murder with the later murders because of the difference in wound patterns. Which also makes sense. Also, um, serial killers are also known to uh, switch up their methods to uh, stay undetected longer. So they think it's different killers. Fun facts for y'all. Alright, let's get into the canonical five Ripper victims. So I'll just say their first name because I said their full names earlier. So Mary, Annie, Elizabeth, Catherine, and Mary... So I'll go Mary K and Mary N. The body of Mary N was discovered about 3.30 a.m. on Friday, 31st, August 1888. I said that backwards as hell, sorry. In the Buck Row, the Bucks Row, now Durward Street, Durward Street, yeah. Whitechapel. Nicole had uh, had last been seen alive approximately one hour before the discovery of her body by Miss Emily Holland, with whom she had previously shared a bed at a common lodge lodging house in Thrall Street, Springfields, walking in the direction of the Whitechapel Road. Her throat was severe severed by two deep cuts one of which completely severed all the tissue down to the vertebrae so to her neck spine area her vagina had been stabbed twice and the lower part of her abdomen was partially ripped open by a deep jagged wound causing her bowels to protrude several other incisions inflicted to both sides of her abdomen had also been caused by the same knife. Each of these wounds had been inflicted in a downward thrust manner, so like a stab slash. So, um, so this was in the middle of the street as well, that one. One week later, Saturday 8th, September 1888, the body of Annie Chapman was discovered at approximately 6 a.m. near the steps of the doorway of the backyard of 26 Hanbury Street, Springfields. As in this case of Marianne Nicole, the throat was severed by two deep cuts who had slashed her throat twice, most likely. Her abdomen had been cut entirely open with a section of the flesh from her stomach being placed upon her left shoulder and another section of skin and flesh, plus her small intestines being removed and placed above her right shoulder, so straight uh, disembowelment and dissection. Chapman's autopsy also revealed that her uterus and sections of her bladder and vagina had been removed. So were they found, or were they missing? At the inquest into Chapman's murder, Elizabeth Long described having seen Chapman standing outside 29 Hanbury Street at about 5.30 a.m. in the company of a dark-haired man wearing a brown deer stalker hat. No clue what that is. Hold on. 
Yeah, whatever. And a dark overcoat. So this could maybe be Jack the Ripper, an eyewitness. And of a shabby, genteel appearance. No clue what that means. According to this eyewitness, the man had asked Chapman the question, Will you? To which Chapman had replied, yes. Interesting, interesting. So maybe they knew each other. Or maybe he just tries to get to know his victims just a little bit to gain their trust or whatever. And then the last two victims of the canonical five, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, were both killed in the early morning hours of Sunday 30th, September 1888. Stride's body was discovered at approximately 1 a.m. in Dutfield's yard off Burner, Burner, Burner Street, B-E-R-N-E-R -E -E Street, um, in Whitechapel, and this is now known as Henrik Street, Henrik Street, H-E-N-R-I-Q-U-E-S, this is in Whitechapel, yes, I said that, the cause of death was a single clear-cut incision measuring six inches across her neck, which had severed her left carotid artery and her trachea, oh word, so she bled out and uh, couldn't breathe, basically. And all of that was before the wound hit, like, beneath her jaw. So, uh, yeah. The absence of any further mutilations to her body has led uncertainty to whether Stride's murder was committed by the Ripper or whether he was interrupted during the attack. So, could have been interrupted. Could have been. Several witnesses later informed the police they had seen Stride in the company of a man or close to Burden Street in company of a man in or close to Burden Street on the evening of the 29th of September and in the early hours of September 30th. Oh, I see. But each gave different descriptions. Some said that her companion was fair, others dark. Some said he was shabbily dressed, others said well dressed. May have been a prostitute. May have been a prostitute. Ebo's, Ebo's body was found in Merritt Square in the city of London three quarters of an hour after the discovery of the body of Elizabeth Stride. Her throat was severed and her abdomen ripped open by a long, deep, and jagged wound before her intestines had been placed over her right shoulder. Again, that's the same as that other uh, murder. The left kidney and major part of the uterus had been removed and her face had been disfigured. With her nose severed, her cheek slashed, and cuts measuring a quarter of an inch and a half an inch, respectively vertical in size through each of her eyelids. So like you know the uh, clown paint or whatever, how they have those vertical lines on their eyes? I'm picturing something like that, but you can uh, go find a picture, of course. A triangular incision, the apex of which pointed towards Edo's eye, had also been carved upon each of her cheeks. Oh, so maybe like a straight clown, holy. And a section of the arcule and lobe of her right ear was later recovered from her clothing. The police surgeon who conducted the post-mortem autopsy of Edo's body stated his opinion these mutilations would have taken at least five minutes to complete. I see. So I think that definitely points to someone with a medical knowledge. Definitely, for sure. A local cigarette salesman named Joseph Laywind had passed through the square with two friends shortly before the murder, and he described seeing a fair-haired man of shabby appearance with a woman who may have been Edo's. Laden's companions were unable to confirm his description. The murders of Stride and Edo's ultimately became known as the double event. Interesting. Interesting.
So it looks like these two murders were carried out about a 30 to 40-ish minute walk away from each other. So it's definitely possible it was the same killer. Interesting. Very interesting. So uh, a section of Edo's bloodied apron was found at an entrance to a tenement in the Golson Street Whitechapel. Golson Street, I hope I said that right, at a 2.55 a.m. So he took it and it was found there, most likely. A chalk inscription upon the wall directly above this piece of apron read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. So this is spelled J-U-W-E-S. Okay, so that's uh, definitely interesting. This graffiti became known as the Glaston Street Graffiti. Hmm. The message appeared to imply that a Jew or Jews in general were responsible for the series of murders. Oh. But it, w it is unclear whether the graffiti was written by the murderer on dropping the section of apron, upon dropping the section of apron, or was merely incidental and nothing to do with the case. I don't know. It's possibly, because, you know, very possibly. What do, you, what do you guys think? Let me know. Such graffiti were commonplace in Whitechapel. Well, there you go. Police Semin Commissioner Charles Warren feared that the graffiti might speak anti-Semit, might spark an anti-Semitic riots and ordered the writing washed away before dawn. I see. Makes sense. Sorry for my uh, bad reading. Kind of get the words jumbled up. I think my mind moves faster than my mouth sometimes. ADHD at its finest. Um, the extensively mutilated and, in and disemboweled body of Mary Jane Kelly was discovered laying on the bed in the single room where she lived at 13 Miller Court off Durton Street, Dor Dorset Street, Springfields at 10.45 a.m. on Friday, November 1888. So this one could be him as well, but uh, for it to be in her house, uh, either a prostitute or someone she knew. Her face had been hacked beyond all recognition, so foobard, fucked up beyond all recognizability, <laughs> uh, with her throat severed down to her spine and the abdominal almost emptied of its organs. Her uterus, kidneys, and one breast had been placed beneath her head, and other vesectories from her body placed beside her foot. About the bed and sections of her abdomen and thigh upon beside a table. Okay. Her head was missing from the crime scene. Oh, her heart was missing from the crime scene. I don't know how I messed that up. Each of the canonical five murders were carried out at night, on or close to the weekend. So he was a party dude. He's like, let's start off the weekend killing some hookers. <laughs> I have this favorite gif I like to use. It's Tig from Sons of Anarchy, and it says, And this is why I beat hookers. <laughs> it's a good gif. I like that gif. Either at the end of a month or a week or so after. <laughs> Damn. Let's uh, kick off the end of this month with murdering some hookers. Holy. And let's start this month murdering hookers. Holy. What a guy. Uh, the mutilations became increasingly severe as the series of murders proceeded, obviously. Except for the stride whose attacker may have been interrupted. Makes sense. Nicole was not missing any organs. Chapman's uterus and sections of her bladder and vagina were taken. Eddowes had her uterus and left kidney removed and her face mutilated. And Kelly's body was extensively eviscerated with her face gashed in all directions. And the tissue of her neck being severed to the bone. Although the heart was the sole body organ missing from the crime scene. 
I wonder what he did with these organs. You think he put them in jars, ate them, or just uh, kind of took them and like fucked them? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows what he did, man? Who knows? But uh, what do you think he did with them? So the idea of it being one killer came in 1894 by, uh, forgive me for mispronouncing these, Sir Melville McIntoughton, <laughs> Assistant Chief Constable of the Metropolitan Police Service and Head of the Criminal Investigation Department. Oh, so it's just the one dude. So the one dude w wrote this report. But this was the organization that was uh, dealing with this. And it stated the Whitechapel murders had five victims and five victims only. Similarly, the canonical five victims were all linked together in a letter written by police Sergio Sir 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 <laughs> Thomas Bond uh, to Robert Anderson. Head of the London CID on November 10th, 1888. Once again, forgive me for my brain farts. I sound dumb as shit sometimes. Bear with me. So, the last victim thought to be Jack the Ripper's final kill was Mary Jane Kelly. And, uh... They think... This was his last crime because he uh, died or was imprisoned or institutionalization or immigration. So they think he died, went to jail, went to a mental asylum or moved. The Whitechapel murder files detailed another four murders that occurred after the canonical five. Those of Rose Maylett. Alice McKenzie and Pinchin, Pinchin, Pinchin Street Torso. Oh, the Pinchin Street Torso. So it's just a straight torso they found. Okay. And Francis Cole. The strangled body of 29-year-old Rose Millette was found in Clark's Yard High Street, Polar, on December 20th. 1888 there was no sign of a struggle and the police believed that she either accidentally hanged herself with her collar while in a drunken stupor committed suicide however faint markings left by a cord on one side of her neck suggested Malat had been strangled Mal Malat had been strangled the inquest into Malat's death the jury returned a verdict of murder. Oh. So this doesn't really match his M.O. Alice McKenzie was murdered shortly after midnight on the 17th of July, 1889 in Castle Alley, Whitechapel. She had suffered two stab wounds to her neck and her left carotid artery had been severed. Several minor bruises and cuts were found on her body which also bore a 7-inch long superficial wound extending between beneath her left breast and her navel. One of the examining pathologists, Thomas Bond, believed this to be the ri a ripper murder, though his colleague, George Bagster Phillips, who was examined the bodies of three previous victims, disagreed. Yeah, these two don't really fit the M.O., Opinions amongst writers are also divided between those who suspect Mackenzie's murder copied the modest operandi of Jack the Ripper to deflect suspicion from himself. Yes, as I said earlier, serial killers are known to do that, so that's actually a possibility. And those who ascribe this murder to Jack the Ripper, yeah, interesting. Interesting, it's definitely a possibility. The Pinch Chin Street Torso was a decomposing headless legless torso of an unidentified woman aged between 30 and 40, discovered beneath a railway arch in Pinchin Street, West Chapel on 
It's the September 10th, 1889. Bruising about the victim's back, hip, and arm indicated the deceased had been extensively beaten shortly before her death. The victim's abdomen was also extensively mutilated, although her genitals had not been wounded. She her she appeared to have been killed approximately one day prior to discovery of her torso. The dismembered sections of the body are believed to have been transported to the railway arch under an old chemis. Chem- chemis. Hmm. This one I think is the most likely to be connected with Jack the Ripper. Because, you know, it's just a torso and there's heavy mutilation. But as I said, her uh, genitals weren't uh, wounded. And at 2.15 a.m. on February 13th, 1891, P.C. Ernest Thompson discovered a 25-year-old prostitute named Francis Coles laying beneath a railway arch at Swallows Gardens, Whitechapel. Her throat had been deeply cut, but her body was not mutilated, leading some to believe Thomas had disturbed her assailant. Makes sense. There's one killer like, not one killer, one victim like that. Coles was still alive, although she died before medical help could arrive. Holy. At 53-year-old a 53-year-old stoker, James Thompson Sandler, had earlier been seen drinking with Coles, and the two are known to have argued approximately three hours before her death. Oh, that might be the killer right there. There's motive. Sadler was arrested by the police and charged with, the, with her murder. He was briefly thought to be the Ripper, but was later discharged from the court for lack of evidence on March 3rd. Oh, that's today. I'm recording this Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. And this was on 1891. Yes, I record my uh, podcasts, these uh, podcasts, on a Wednesday, so they are up on a Friday. They take hours to upload because my internet's complete shit. So, um, there are other alleged victims, but uh, none are as certain as those ones. So, if you're curious, you can uh, check out the link. It'll be in the description below or just search up jack the ripper and uh it'll come up but uh yeah so let's touch on their investigation most of their files on the murders the whitechapel murders were destroyed in a blizzard the surviving metropolitan police files allow a detailed view of investigative procedures in the victorian era A large team of policemen conducted house-to-house inquiries throughout Whitechapel, so they went door-to-door looking for evidence, because they could do that back then. Forensic materials were collected and examined. Suspects were identified, traced, and either examined more closely or eliminated from the inquiry. Modern police work follows the same pattern. More than 2,000 people were interviewed. Upwards of 300 people were investigated and 80 people were detained following the murders of Stride and Eddowes. The commissioner of the city police, Sir James Farrers, offered a reward of £500 for the arrest of the Ripper. I don't know how much that would be in today's money. Let me uh, go check. Uh, However, I have no clue. I couldn't find it. Maybe you guys can, but I'm guessing it would be a lot. The investigation was initially conducted by the Metropolitan Police Whitechapel Division Criminal Investigation Department CID headed by Detective Inspector Edmund Reed, R-E-I-D, after the murder of Nicole's Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline 
Henry Moore and Walters Andrew were sent from central office at Scotland Yard to assist. So they sent in the big boys. The city of London, the city of London police were involved under Detective Inspector James McWilliam after the Ed, Edo's murders, which occurred within the city of London. The overall direction of the murder inquiries was hampered by the fact that the newly appointed head of the CID, Robert Anderson, was on le on leave in Switzerland between s the 7th of September and the 6th of October, a month vacation. During the time when Chapman, Stride, and Eddowes were killed, this promoted... Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Charles Warren to appoint Chief Inspector Donald Swanson to coordinate the entirety of Scotland Yard. Interesting. Butchers, slaughterers, surgeons, and physicians were suspected because of the manner of the mutilations. Makes sense. A surviving note from the Major Henry Smith Acting Commissioner of the City Police in this indicates that the alibis of local butchers and slaughterers were investigated, with the result that they were eliminated from the previous six months' words, so they had alibis. Well, some of them did. Some contemporary figures, including Queen Victoria, thought the pattern... The pattern of murders indicated that the culprit was a butcher or a cattle drover on one of the cattle boats that piled between London and mainland Europe. Whitechapel was close to the London docks. Okay, makes sense so far. And usually such boats docked on Thursdays or Fridays and departed Saturdays or Sundays. Makes sense. The cattle boats were examined, but the dates of the murders did not coincide with a single boat's movement, and the transfer of a crewman between the boats was also ruled out. Makes sense, makes sense. There is even a, vigilant, a vigilance committee where citizens grouped up and patrolled the streets, and this happened in September 1888. So, uh, yeah, the citizens were like, alright, that's enough. We'll uh, patrol the streets looking for suspicious characters. Partially because the disenfranchisement with the failure of the police to apprehend the perpetrator. And also because some members were concerned that the murders were affecting businesses in the area. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go down there if you knew fucking prostitutes were getting murdered. The committee petitioned the government to raise a re the reward for information leading to the arrest of the killer, offered their own reward of £50 for information leading to his capture, and hired private detectives to question witnesses independently. Interesting. Very interesting. So, in October... Uh, tr a police officer investigator dude asked police surgeon Thomas Bond to give his opinion on the extent of the murderer's surgical skills and knowledge. The opinion offered by Bond on the character of the Whitechapel murderer is the earliest surviving offer offender profile. Bond's assessment was based on his own examination of the most extensive mutilated victim and the post-mortem notes from the four previous murders. He said, All five murders no doubt were committed by the same hand. In the first four, the throats appeared to have been cut from left to right. In the last case, owing to the extensive mutilation, it is impossible to say in what direction the fatal cut was made, but art, art, arterial, arterial blood was found on the wall in splashes close to where the woman's head must have been laying. All circumstances surrounding the murders lead me to form the opinion that the woman 
must have been laying down when murdered, and in every case, the throat was first cut. So this dude was like, yeah, it's the same person. Bond was strongly opposed to the idea that the murderer possessed any kind of scientific or anatomical knowledge, or even the technical knowledge of a butcher or horse slaughterer. In his opinion, the killer must have been a man of solitary habits, su subject to periodical attacks of homicidal and erotic mania, with the character of the mutilations possibly indicating stereacy. Stereacy. <laughs> Don't know if I said that right. S A T Y R I A S I S. Bond also stated that the homicidal impulse may have developed from a, a vengeful or boral, bo brooding, brooding condition of the mind. Oh, interesting. Makes sense. So a hatred towards women and or hookers. Or that religious mania may have been the original disease, but I don't think either hypothesis is likely. So... He stated that it was could have been revenge or something like that or religious mania. But he's like, I don't think that's very likely. So uh, there is no evidence that the perpetrator engaged in sexual activity with the victims. Yet psychologists suppose that the penetration of the victims with the knife and leaving them on display in sexual diggering positions... Degrade, sexually degrading positions with the wounds exposed indicates that the perpetrator derives sexual pleasure from the attacks. This view is challenged by others who dismiss such hypotheses as insupportable supposition. Interesting. All these big book learning words. <laughs> if you get that reference, you're deadly. As well to the contradictions and unreliability of contemporary accounts, attempts to identify the murderer are hampered by the lack of any surviving forensic evidence. Yes. DNA analysis on extant, extant letters is inconclusive. The available material has been handled many times and is too contaminated to provide anything meaningful. There have been mutual inc incompatible claims that DNA evidence points conclusively to two different suspects and the methodology of both has been criticized. Yeah, interesting. Not much evidence from DNA would be available after all those years, because think about it, 1888 and 89, all the way to whenever DNA evidence was, uh, you know, invented. Yeah, I have no clue when it was invented, but I don't, it's well over like 100 or 200 years easily well, 100 we'll go 100 years well over 100 years they did however think the ripper lived in the location and worked locally this makes sense because he'd be able to know who frequented there and uh, who would uh, most likely not be noticed if uh well not be well maybe not not be noticed but like he knew what was up and he knew that uh they wouldn't question much, or they'd question certain people if he uh, took them out. Maybe. That makes sense. People also think that the killer was uh, an educated upper-class man, possibly a doctor or an arist aristocrat who ventured into Whitechapel for a more well-to-do area. Well, makes sense if a rich person wanted to do some killing, go to a poor area, no one would ever question the rich, especially in this uh, day, well, that day and age. So, uh, yeah, that makes uh, pretty good sense. There's also a theory where a member of the British royal family was uh, thought to be a suspect, like a conspiracy theory type of deal. 
There were also other famous people such as artists, physicians, and stuff like that. But of course, they were all rich and higher up. And uh, yeah, they wouldn't question those people. Because like, how could, these, how could those rich people do this? This is a poor person thing kind of deal. Everyone alive at the time is now long dead, obviously. And modern of authors are free to accuse anyone without any need for supporting historical evidence. Yep. You can't you can accuse a dead man and they can't fight back. Suspects named in the contemporary police documents include three in Sir McLevel McNaton's eighteen ninety four Mandorendum, but the evidence against these individuals is at best circumstantial. Yep. There are many ver varied theories about the identity and profession of Jack the Ripper, but authors are not agreed upon any of them, which makes sense, and the number of named suspects reaches over 100. Despite continuous interest in the case, the Ripper's identity remains unknown, obviously. There is a term for this uh, case, it's called Ripperology, and this was coined to describe the study and analysis of the Jack the Ripper cases and the murders that have inspired numerous works of fiction. So uh, yeah, he's a killer that has his own term, I wouldn't call it a verb. Actually, that would be a verb, I think, because what a verb is a describing word, if I'm not mistaken. The case also received a bunch of letters. Some were well-intentioned, but most were uh, hoaxes or genuinely uh, useless. But uh, yeah, lots of letters claim to be the killer himself, and three of these in particular are promoted... Dear Boss Letter, the Saucy Jackie Postcard, <laughs> and the From Hell Letter. So, uh, yeah, most of these were uh, prank letters and all the such. You guys can uh, look into those if you want. But I think the most compelling letter, the From Hell Letter with the piece of human kidney, is the most likely to be from the killer. And then uh, there is a bunch of media about him. Fucking, yeah, movies, books, all that stuff. You guys can uh, go look that up if you want. I'm not going to list all those. But, uh, yeah. His uh, murders have um been etched into history and all that stuff. And, uh, for good reason. They were uh, very vicious. And, uh, yeah. Jack the Ripper later became a boogeyman type. To scare the children in the south end of London or whatever. Depictions were often phantomistic or monstrous. So he took form into a legend. And in the 1920s and 30s he was depicted in film. Dressed in everyday clothes as a man hiding a secret. Preying on his unsuspecting victims. Yep. But uh, yeah. It's just a lot of... uh movies and folklore surrounding this uh monster in 2015 the jack the ripper museum opened in east london to minor protests there is no waxwork figure of jack the ripper at the museum at the madame tussaud's chamber of horrors obviously because there's a uh, no way to know what he looks like Unlike numerous murderers of lesser fame in accordance with their policy of not modeling persons whose likeliness is unknown, obviously. He is instead depicted as a shadow. In 2006, a BBC History magazine poll selected Jack the Ripper as the worst Britone. Britonian in history makes sense so that is Jack the Ripper the serial killer monster turned into a myth 
and a legend, a scary bedtime story to frighten little kids, and point to make money. Thank you for listening to this episode on the Murder House Radio Show. Check out the social medias and the sources in the description. See you next episode. This is your host, X, signing off.